Behind the Brand features the people who are making things happen. Get the insight to grow your biz from experts who've done it. Get Behind the Brand. Hi, I'm Brian Elliott. Welcome to another edition of Behind the Brand. Today I'm here with Simon Mannering, founder and author of the book We First. Simon, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. I typically ask my guests, how'd you get this job? How did I get this job? Well, like most entrepreneurs, you create it for yourself. Um, but if I was to walk back the journey, I started in advertising in Australia, which is why I talk the way I do, and then worked in London for a long time at agencies like Saatchi and Saatchi and Ligas Delaney on brands like Harrods, the BBC, The Guardian and Adidas or Adidas. And that got me headhunted to go and work at Wyden and Kennedy at, on Nike in Portland, which is a great creative agency. And I did that for four years. And then I was worldwide creative director for Motorola at Ogilvy. But for the last 11 years, like many of your um, community, I've been an entrepreneur. I've been a hired gun being brought in through top ad agencies or digital shops or direct to client, brought in to fix the messaging of large you know, Fortune 100 companies or startups. And so I found myself in a position a few years ago, like other entrepreneurs going, look at the way the marketplace is changing. Mm -hmm. Look at the way social media is giving your customers a chance to talk back to you. And as a guy who's worked on the Olympics and World Cup and, and run global accounts, I thought this is gonna change everything. Because in advertising, we usually sort of fabricate that relationship between a brand and its customer. Then suddenly you can make, let it happen organically. You're buying attention, right? You, you can carve out media and you can get eyeballs. And so the game is changing, isn't it? The game is changing dramatically and it doesn't matter whether it's 2011 or 2012 or whether it's, you know, the 1990s. When technology comes in that fundamentally reinvents the way the business needs to be practiced, if you don't move with it, it's no surprise that you're going to be a casualty. And this is true of large corporations of tens of thousands of employees or an entrepreneur or a nonprofit that has two or three people working for it. Right. So we've got to change right now. So is it the technology that's changing everything or is it, is it something else? The technology is creating new dynamics, and those dynamics are important. I mean, in marketing, the currency we still trade is emotion. If you and I don't connect on an emotional level, you're not going to buy anything I have to right. sell, no matter what technology lens it comes through. Right. But when social media comes along and is A, simple, and B, effectively free, then all those sort of barriers to entry fall away, and you've got customers saying, I don't agree with this, or I, I, want, I will only support you with my purchasing dollars if you are socially responsible, and that's what we see going on now. Yeah. I feel, too, like this generation, I've got kids who are you know, in their teenage years now. Right. Uh, they're hardwired different than I am, so I'm Generation X, right. and you know, it's really different. It seems like the kids these days, uh, I feel old saying that, but like, they have this sense of purpose, too. Like It's not just about um, you know, showing off what they're doing and getting 12 million hits for their cool dance on YouTube, but like it's also giving back and contributing to their social graph or the community or something, doing something new. Do you sense that? Yeah, no, they do. I think they come to the world, like many of us when we're younger, with an optimism and a desire to contribute and a, and a sense of humanity, but there's a big difference. I mean, when we were growing up and, and were kids and teenagers, it was almost like there was this drive to of self-interest. You know, you wanted to yeah. get to the top. I'm number one. I'm number one. It's yeah. me or at the sake, you know, at the cost of everyone else. But now there's such a crisis on so many social levels and these kids are so much more aware of it thanks to the internet and so much more capable of talking about it thanks to social media yeah. that it's tapping into that thing that is innate to them at that age and they're saying, no, we won't accept our parents' past. We want our own future. Yeah. And so we're going to demand that you know, companies behave differently. And I think too, just speaking about that, that, that youth group, you know, that generation also seems, there's a lot of criticism. Well, they're constantly texting. They're the least right. social generation of our time. But I think just the opposite is true. You know, there's two schools of thought here. There's some wonderful thought leaders like Sherry Turkle from MIT, who's written a book like Alone Together, which is this sense of sort of arm's length intimacy and what's the cost of that. Yeah. Yet at the same time, the ability to connect with somebody on the other side of the world in real time that you can otherwise never reach, that's a whole new sort of spectrum of yeah. connection that never existed before. So it's a trade-off. And like anything, I think there's a pendulum swing. You know, we're all going to be so capable of sharing so much stuff, we'll actually never be have any time to do anything to share. Yeah. And then I'm sure the pendulum will swing, swing back the other way and people will be charging a fortune to go and have an unplugged experience in the middle of a field. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but I do see you know, people connected like never before, whether they're young or old. And I think social media just enables that sharing. And you're right. 
nothing has really changed. Um, uh, another author friend of mine, Simon Salt, said, you know, everything and nothing has changed about social media. Right. You know, everything and nothing has changed about what's happening in the digital world because it's still about relationships. Mm-hmm. Um, just these platforms make it easier to share, make it easier to connect, breaking down geography barriers and, and even access barriers, right? If I want to have a discussion or a, a tweet with my favorite athlete or uh, actor or whatnot, I can do it now. It's true, and it's almost those timeless um, traits, the emotional connection between people that's essential, they're almost more true t- today than ever in the sense that for a long time there were these media monopolies out there. There was television, print, radio that were controlled by a certain number of networks. Right. And, that, you know, they're aligned with ad agencies and Nielsen ratings, and that had a monopoly. That told us what to think, what to buy, what to do, what right. was cool. Now they've fallen away. It's almost just cleared the clutter away for what has always been timeless, which is it's a connection between, between people, generally around shared values, working towards a common purpose that makes their life meaningful. And social media has just kind of breathed new life into that timeless quality and these old monopolies are struggling because their profit centers their business models don't work anymore and that's you know that's for every businessman that's a that's a businesswoman that's a big challenge so people watching this show you know they're small business owners they're entrepreneurs trying to put the puzzle together what advice would you give them uh, about now you know their their brand has a, a character they have a face um, it's not just a logo they're actually able to converse and have conversations with their customers what advice would you give them there's, there's a, a huge and critical piece of advice I give them, but th- where you started with that question is absolutely um, spot on. Brands, you know, as an ad guy for years, we always get these briefs from the agency, and they always say brand personality at the top and core values, and then you get down to the creative brief. And you'd always skip past those as if, yeah, yeah, whatever, whatever. But now that's actually true. A brand has to have a face, it has to have a voice, it has to have an identity because it's engaging customers in a one-on-one basis. Yeah. And it's not just... You know, it used to be broadcast media was one to many. I'd put a television ad on and it'd go to many people watching television. Now I put a television ad on or I put a video on and it goes to you, Brian. Yeah. And then you can share it with many. So that yeah. relationship is important. But the biggest piece of advice I'd say is I've spent the last 11 years as a consultant going into you know, these large brands and fixing their messaging. And I've watched this transition towards social technology, social media, social business. And... Like many new things, we make some fairly obvious mistakes in that three years ago we're sitting there going, is social media a fad? And that was the big discussion. Now that question has gone away. And the opposite is true. People are all rushing to social technology too quickly. And what they're overlooking is the importance of brand storytelling in the first place. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't have a brand story that is framed in human and emotional terms, that forges an emotional connection to your customer those tools and channels won't amplify your message. They won't work for you. And unfortunately, a lot of brands, particularly entrepreneurs with limited resources and time, are rushing towards tactics and strategies without a brand story in place. They'll do a a Facebook or a Twitter or Foursquare or a Google Plus strategy, but they wonder why it never ladders up. It never aggregates to a larger brand presence, awareness, community that continues to build their business with them. So as a long-time traditional media guy, and now very deep in the social world, it's this marriage of brand storytelling and social technology that is absolutely critical to a startup, a social enterprise, a non-profit, or a, or a small, mid-sized brand. Give us some specifics. Let's break it down a little bit more. So maybe take Nike or someone like that from your past experience. Uh, I'll give you a great example of community building. I believe every brand needs to become a community architect. And Nike's done several things. One of the most powerful ways to be meaningful to your customer's life is to demonstrate a concern for something greater than yourself. In a global community, you're actually demonstrating you care about the well-being of that community above and beyond just your bottom line. So they've done the Nike Green Exchange, where they've opened up all their IP to their competitors so they can all address climate change together. You know, um, they have released the environmental design tool, which shows how they reduce the carbon footprint of their supply chain so all their competitors could do the same. But even more than that, you know, and they support the, you know, Livestrong Foundation, even more than that, they're very, very smart about how they architect community. And I'll give you a concrete example. Lance Armstrong, um, I had the good fortune to go up to and chat with Doug Ullman at the Livestrong Foundation recently and at the Tour de France, the last Tour de France in 2010, I think it actually was, they wanted to support the Livestrong Foundation. And so they reached out to cancer sufferers and they said, could you send us a short message about what cancer meant in your life? Now that's dangerous because could you imagine a for-profit brand 
setting itself up to being guilty of exploiting the heartfelt suffering of cancer yep. sufferers for the sake of their brand. Yep. So what they did was they got these messages and they created something called a chalk bot. And it was just like a big printer on the back of a truck. And they spray painted those messages like I'm doing this for my mum or, you know, I miss you, dad, or whatever it might be on the road in chalk in front of the cyclists in the Tour de France. So all the global media pointed at the tour broadcast those messages for free. And in yeah. so doing, they raised over $4 million for the foundation during the course of the tour and got millions of impressions and so on. But here's what's so important. In terms of being a community architect, they respected, they had mutual respect for the people sending those messages in. So they took a photograph of each message on the road and sent it back to the person who sent it in so they could print it out and put it on their wall. That's a dialogue. That's respect. That's yeah. effective community architecture where a brand isn't exploiting you. Yeah, that's, that just doesn't leave people hanging. You know, it feels like there's a relationship there. There's a relationship, and they're, they're invested in you, and they actually are listening. And they don't stop listening when the conversation is, has stopped serving them. Yeah. They actually continue the conversation, and that's what's so powerful. And I'll give you one more example. You know, Procter & Gamble, one of the largest companies in the world, one of their brands, Pampers, diapers. I'm a dad, got two daughters. I remember diapers well. When you buy a packet of Pampers... It funds one tetanus vaccination for mothers or newborn children in the developing world. And in the last four years, they've funded over uh, 31 million vaccinations, saving an estimated over 100,000 lives. Now, if you look at the alignment between what a mother cares about with a child when they're buying Pampers and the core values of the brand and the, and the fact that, you know, that mother can make a contribution to a child on the other side of the world, yeah. that is meaningful. Yeah. It aligns. It, it totally makes sense. Yeah. It's not greenwashing or cause washing. And that's where I think the opportunity is so exciting. So do you think this is a trend then? I mean, we, we've seen success with like Blake over at Tom's Shoes. Sure. You know, uh, you've written this book, We First. Talk to us a little bit about the book, who you wrote it for, and what it's about. We First is my expression of a tonic to the me first mentality that informed business for a long time. It was all about, you know, as an extension of the American dream or whatever, how, keeping up with the Joneses, everyone was in it for themselves and particularly business. And that led to 2007, 2008, the global economic meltdown and the continued behavior of a lot of, you know, business practices which yeah. serve themselves, top CEO salaries, the disproportion between CEO salaries and the average employee, those sorts of things that people are very upset about. We First is a new way of looking at business through the lens of, a, of an intimately connected and interdependent global community. Because look what happened in 2008. What happened on Wall Street affected Main Street. Mm -hmm. It affected our homes, our jobs, our health care, our hopes. It affected Iceland. It affected Greece. It affected the stock market in Europe, Middle East. So suddenly, we realized that we're all dependent on each other. This community, the internationalization of currency, social media, the way we're all connected through business, we're all in it together. Yeah. So it's a, the book is a new vision for the private sector where it plays a more purposeful role in terms of leadership, employees, entrepreneurship, and nonprofits. How do they use this social technology to amplify their message, to scale their business, to increase their positive social impact so that the private sector becomes a third pillar of social change to help out government and philanthropy. Because we all know that government has this historic debt. Philanthropy can only do so much. And with all this heightened awareness about business practices, customers out there are going, hold it. You're making how much? And you're polluting how much? Right. And these things are getting cut because we can't afford them? I'm not going to buy your product if you're not more socially responsible. And there's some wonderful examples. I mean, you look at Net Netflix when it had to back down over Quickster mm -hmm. because it was 700,000 or 800,000 customers left. Their stock price dropped 37%. They backed down. Then there was Bank of America, $5 debit charge, monthly debit charge. Then it was Bank Transfer Day where 750,000 people transferred to credit unions to the tune of $4.5 billion. Yeah. Then it was Verizon's $2 pay your bills online fee. Even just in the last few days, you know, the pushback against SOPA, yeah. you know, where basically websites shut down and said, we're not going to let you censor the internet. The customer out there is going, we've seen the Arab Spring revolutions, we've seen Occupy movement, we've seen what's going on with cyber terrorism. We see that people are actually flexing their muscles and saying, enough. Yeah. And I think unless business responds, whether you're two people or 10,000 people, the marketplace will leave you behind. I, I'm right with you. I, you know, one times one does not multiply very far. You right. know, can't do it ourselves. Right. And we is definitely more powerful than 
uh, we is more powerful than yeah, than me. Than me, yeah. And you know, so you start multiplying. You know, uh, one times a hundred, one times a thousand, yeah. one times a million. Yeah. You know, big things can happen. They can, and it's incremental. I mean, I'll give you a concrete example. Zenga, the, the largest social game maker on yep. the Facebook platform, Farmville, Frontierville, Mafia yep. Walls, all the, how do they, I mean, who has time for those? But lots of people do, and it's wonderful. When the uh, Haiti earthquake happened, they created special virtual goods, those little digital things that you can put inside your game, like sure. a haystack or a loaf of bread, for the Haiti earthquake victims. And they generated over $1.5 million in a 24-hour period because when people bought those virtual goods for $0.99, cents, for $1.99, the proceeds went to the earthquake victims. Yeah. So look at the power of scale of connecting social gaming and fun with contribution. And now we see offline brands like Pizza Hut. Pizza Hut has just done a big promotion with Zynga where if you buy pizza from Pizza Hut, you can buy limited edition virtual goods that you can put inside your games that go to the World Food Program. So there's an offline brand scaling through a social gamer and together they're supporting a cause that's in alignment with the core values of that brand Pizza Hut, World Food Program, Pizza Hut. This is what's so exciting because it doesn't just improve the lives of other people, it drives the bottom line of the business. Yeah. So that's what's so critical. That's brilliant. Yeah, That's good for a big company like Zynga. Sure. Um, you talk about Procter & Gamble, big brands. What can small sole proprietors, you know, people got, have startups out there, what can they do on a smaller scale? Absolutely. I mean, from a personal point of view, I had to sit down myself and would identify what my purpose was with We First. I have two daughters. My wife is a Montessori-trained school teacher, and I believe that clean water, women, and education are the three pillars to building a better world, you know, and so we support the United Nations Girl Up Foundation. So that's a direct experience of how I came to a solution. So it doesn't have to be lofty or idealistic, it just needs to be personal. But if you're an entrepreneur or sole proprietor, I'll give you a couple of examples. There's a single store in New York called um, Four Food, the number four and then food. And their tagline is de-junking fast food. So they want to address obesity and healthy eating. Right. So they invite their customers to create burgers and name them. So there's the California Cation Burger. And when you go in there, unfortunately, and when you go in there and buy that burger, the more people that buy it, they go up the leaderboard, sure. like the Billboard Top 100. Yeah. So they're co-creating a solution that addresses a larger purpose and building a community through it. Another example, there was recently um, the first pink hydrangea was, a flower was invented, um, developed, and it's pink. And so, you know, they reached out to the Breast Cancer Foundation and said, listen, every time someone buys this flower from a nursery, we'll give a dollar towards the foundation. So it's infinitely scalable, whether you're like me, just giving to a, an existing cause that you care about, or whether it's through the lens of a product like a hydrangea, you know, or whether it's co-creating products and services like Four Food is in, in New York. It's, it's so creative. And it's so fulfilling for the sole proprietor because every day you go for, to work and every day your one or two or three employees come to work, they know they're actually making a meaningful contribution. Simon, thank you so much for spending some time with us. You've been watching Behind the Brand with Simon Mannering. Thank you. This Behind the Brand episode is brought to you by Raven Internet Marketing Tools, powerful data and tools for online marketers. Get a free trial at raventools.com behind.